back nine years ago, in 2015, it was a cold, wet Danish November. Nobody likes a cold, wet Danish November, but me even less. I'm stood in the middle of a field with my rubber boots and a research experiment. And my experiment in this field was centered around the measurement of ammonia from what we in Latin call fimo porcus. Or to put it in more modern English, pig poop. <laughs> For four days, I was walking up and down this cold, wet field measuring ammonia from the aforementioned fimo porcus. And after four days, in the rain, in the cold, I could barely feel my feet. I trudged back to the office, and I tried to peel off my poop-stained rubber boots, and they just won't come off. But I have great colleagues. <laughs> they rush in to help. They grab me by a boot, and they pull, and they pull, but my feet are so swollen from being out in the field that it just won't come off. The next thing I know, they're dragging me across the floor, using me like I'm up, <laughs> and still nothing happens, and they're pulling with all of their might. Finally, they take a pair of scissors, and they slice off my boots, and at that moment I thought, like any academic, if only there was a better way to measure ammonia emissions than having to ruin a perfectly good pair of rubber boots. <laughs> So, instead of looking down at the ground, I look up to the skies and to the satellites above me, and I turn my attention from the manure on the ground to up there. Because up there sits thousands of satellites, and they're hurling across space at about 27,000 kilometers per hour. And to the people here today that are unfamiliar with the metric system, I don't know how many, uh, <laughs> That is about as fast as people drive on the highway just south of here on Friday afternoons on the way home from work. <laughs> You're laughing because you know it's true. <laughs> but these satellites, they have tasks that they were born to carry out. They were specifically designed to carry out certain missions. Normally, they would be doing things like monitoring greenhouse gases in the atmosphere or monitoring aerosols of various origins or telling us something about land cover. But why not use the same satellites to quantify ammonia emissions from space? And the best thing about that would be that I wouldn't have to be in a cold, wet field in my rubber boots to do it. And we have to track and measure ammonia emissions. When it's in the ground, that's where we want it, that's where it should be. You know, it's, it's easy for, to forget, but actually fertilizing is key to ensuring that there is sufficient food for everyone. So, we need to fertilize, it is necessary, but the problem is that as soon as it goes astray, it becomes unwanted ammonia pollution. And then things get tricky. Ammonia pollution damages the environment through several mechanisms that all ultimately change the very ecosystem that we live in for the worse. It is involved in reducing biodiversity. It is involved in acidification of our ecosystems. So, bottom line, it is involved in processes that are harmful to humans, animals, plants, and insects. But what's worse? It also gets up there, in the air. Transformed into fine particles, damaging air quality and getting back into your lungs and brain. And mind you, in the EU, we send about 3.2 million metric tons of ammonia into the atmosphere every year. And it's the particles up there that become a part of the global problem. With one gust of wind, these particles can travel a thousand kilometers from a neighboring country to your backyard. It is inherently transboundary. It doesn't observe borders. It just doesn't care. And these particles that we call PM2.5, you know, you may know them as PM2.5, they are directly, <laughs> thank you, uh, they are directly tied or contributing to the economic burden of ammonia pollution. It has, you know, it's difficult to put a number on, but it has been estimated that 
it costs about 3.2 billion euros, including healthcare costs. And talking about healthcare, these particles, they are known to onset neuroinflammatory diseases, and some studies have shown that it also is a su suggested involvement in uh, neurological diseases, respiratory diseases, cardiovascular diseases. And with all, the le with all of these um, side effects, we have to ask the question, what are we going to do? You know, it is contributing to the excess annual mortality rate. That is 230,000 in 2020, 230,000 people that prematurely died, and that is attributed to PM2.5. So what would be a game changer here? Let's go back. It's been nine years since I was in the field in my poop-stained rubber boots. Yes. And development has happened. The idea of monitoring ammonia emissions from space is not far-fetched, and the scientific community has seen the first measurements. So from that viewpoint, it's a success. But there's still way to go. We need a better spatial resolution, ideally all the way down to a single farm or a single piece of land. That would be transformative. So together with industrial partners, we are currently exploring the use of a new camera, a special camera that we hope to make able to see ammonia emissions, even if the human eye can't. And I think that could be a game changer. That could be a game changer. Because it's not about the particles, it is about understanding what drives them, what emits them. Different soils emit different amounts of, uh, of, um, of ammonia at different rates, and it all depends on the weather conditions. So if we could use this system, we could give better advice to farmers on when to fertilize and under which conditions to do so. That would use them less ammonia and ultimately saving money. But that's not all. The thing is, these techniques would be far more scalable than the ones that we currently use today. The ones that we use today, they are, are very good at measuring ammonia concentrations locally. They do that at a point, at a single point, or across a line. They are excellent locally, but they lack scalability. I often compare these traditional techniques to smoke detectors. Put a smoke detector in your living room. That's great. Put a smoke detector in your kitchen. Actually, hang on. Can I, can I stop this TED, TEDx talk for a very important public service announcement? You should put, if you haven't already done it, you should put a smoke detector in your kitchen. The point is, it doesn't matter which smoke detector goes off. You know that the fire is somewhere inside. You get out and call for help, and you pass on the location of that fire to the emergency response services as your postal address. Now take the same two smoke detectors right, and place them anywhere of your choosing. I'll let, I'll, you'll pick in the 400 million hectares that were burned down by wildfires in 2023. You pick where you want to place them. The point is, the same two smoke detectors would have very little indication, or they would provide very little indication about the spreading of the fire. They measure at one point. They measure very locally. That is the power of a camera. It can see things over time and over space. And that, to me, I think would be transformative. It's important to know that this is not a surveillance type tool. It's a decision support tool that allows farmers to optimize better, to use less fertilizer. And beyond all, it is a tool which ensures that we fertilize under the right conditions. So, taking an uncompromising view, I think that this technology has what it takes to, to really bring us from a, a very high standpoint to give us the technology that we need to get to where we need to be. Farmers need this. <laughs> they do. <laughs> we need this. The um, approximately 92% uh, of total emissions stem from agriculture. 
So it's a very big share that stems from agriculture. But it's important to note that agriculture itself is not exactly the problem. Humankind is a part of the problem. But I find some consolation in the fact that I think we can also be a part of the solution. Unfortunately, I'm not here to tell you today that the job is done. Unfortunately. In fact, far from it. It may take up to 10 years to put a technology like this onto a satellite and into space. So, frankly, that's about half a generation it would take to solve one of the major challenges of our generation. It's such a complicated process. My point is, I think that the days of thinking of technological developments as solely technological developments, they're coming to an end. They're over. Increasingly, we also have to think about the operational context in which these technologies will operate. Because 10 years is a long lead time for any technology that we urgently need. And this is exactly what I mean. For these technologies that I was talking about, the camera, we also need to think about new ways to deploy them that are faster and more scalable than the traditional techniques, um, such as satellites. Unmanned aerial vehicles or autonomous aerial vehicles could be a part of the solution. That would be transformative also in the sense that it would give us the spatial resolution that we need to make this work. With all of that said, the technologies will have to come together. They will have to converge in order for us to actually use them to solve challenges, global challenges. And I have some hope that we can make that work. So, my hope for the future, my idea worth spreading, if you think so, is to imagine a world with cleaner rivers, fresher lakes, less ammonia pollution in the atmosphere, more efficiency to the farmers, and less costs to you, the consumers. I think that we have to be very careful ensuring that technologies are translated from the laboratory and to the users in an operational context where they make a difference and of utmost importance. If we do this, I don't have to be out in the field <laughs> in my rubber boots spending a casual Wednesday with my pig poop. Thank you. <laughs>